Welcome to the latest edition of the OmniTalk Spotlight Series. I am your host, Chris Walton, one of the founders of OmniTalk, a content platform dedicated to researching and talking to the people, the companies, and the technologies that are shaping the future of retail. Today, I am thrilled to bring two experts onto our show to discuss a topic that, given everything that's going on today, is quite possibly one of the most important concepts out there, and that is inventory accuracy and RFID. Joining me today are Chris Barton, the Director of Market Development and RFID at Retail for Avery Dennison, and Umesh Kudavali, the Vice President of Sales at Detego. Chris, Umesh, welcome to the show. How are you guys doing today? Thank you, Chris. Good. Yeah. Good. Thanks for having us. Yeah, Thank awesome. You. Now, before we get started, I'm excited to talk to you both. Before we get started, just a reminder for all of you that are joining us live right now on LinkedIn, you can place your questions for Chris and Umesh in the chat box to the right throughout our conversation, and all three of us will be happy to take your questions as we go along. And in true OmniTalk style, no questions are off the table. Free feel, feel free excuse me, to uh, ask these guys anything that comes into your mind through the, through the scope of this conversation, because I imagine there's going to be a lot uh, that you're going to want to ask these guys. So, all right, well, let's get started first. Let's do a little bit of background on who you guys are and why you're quote-unquote quote experts in RFID. Chris, why don't we start with you? Sure. So, um, Chris Barton, I've been with Avery Dennison for almost 11 years now, um, primarily focused on retail RFID. Um, prior to that, I've been in the industry with a couple other uh, positions for roughly about 20 years in the RFID UHF space specifically. So very broad background in retail and item level tagging specifically. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, that sounds very, like, very much an expert on this subject, if I had to guess. <laughs> All right, Imash, what about you? What's your background? Yeah, yeah I've been in the RFID space for um, close to two decades. And, wow. Uh, I've done pilots and rollouts in the US and in Europe and also in Asia. So bring a lot of experience and uh, field knowledge. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Well, it sounds like I've got the right two gentlemen to speak with us today on the subject. So, all right, well, let's, let's first set the landscape for everyone. Uh, you know, let's get, a, let's get your current diagnosis on the current state of RFID. Because I think, as you guys mentioned, you guys have now been at this for you know, 20 years between the two of you, if not more. Um, you know, Amesh, what, what, how would you describe it? What is the current state of RFID and how penetrated is it now across retail? Yeah, Chris, I would say it's probably about, you know, 14 to 15% penetration. Okay. Uh, yeah, it, may, it was a lot lower before, but uh, <laughs> the technology itself, you know, it's really a foundational technology that changes the business. The, you know, it's an enterprise-wide system and the C-level folks need to be involved in it and needs a cross-functional team, uh, you know, people who are involved would be merchandising team, planning team, store ops, uh, supply chain. So it's really impacts the whole business uh, with great returns. Uh, so, and also, you know, in terms of, uh, there's three, really three components that make up a whole system, the tag, okay. the software and the hardware. So everything has to be brought together and finally, that's happening with our partnership with Avery Dennison and Detego. We are able to do that. And, uh, and the adoption is increasing every day and particularly with, uh, you know, with the pandemic and what happened, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, that's had a major impact on uh, adoption. Yeah, so, so that's surprising, 14%. Like if you, if you stop and think about it, like in a lot of ways, that's still kind of a low figure. You know, Chris, why do you, why do you think that is? I mean, it sounds like it's been, to a master point, it's been growing, you know, you know, much more rapidly in terms of adoption in the last, you know, year and a half, let's say, because of the pandemic. But Chris, like, why is that, why is that number still so low? Like, what's, what's, what's held it back, you know, from wider spread adoption at this point? So we've seen some pretty good adoption amongst several of the larger players, um, department stores, um, some of the vertical brands. Um, have adopted, and we've seen some pretty good traction in a few other areas as well. But I think over time we'll see a greater adoption in and more the non-traditional apparel categories that, that are out there. But for the most part, over the last five years, I would say that traction has picked up significantly. And as Umesh mentioned, the pandemic has just kind of thrown fuel on the fire for reasons why people need to adopt RFID and get their inventory accuracy right in order to properly operate. Yeah, and, what, and, and I should ask this too, like categorically, you know, 14% is a broad number, like categorically to level set the audience, we're seeing adoption of RFID in, in certain categories relative to others, right? Like you mentioned apparel, is that right, Chris? Like you're seeing it relatively higher there. Where else are you seeing it relatively higher, let's say? Across? Yeah, so 
Yeah, that's a great question, Chris. So the major categories or the key categories that people have adopted are apparel, footwear, accessories, soft home. Those are areas that have seen a large amount of penetration, especially in the big box players that are out there. In addition to that, we're starting to see additional traction and and maybe more than non-traditional spaces. So areas like food, we've seen omni-channel uh, interest in the food space pick mm. up. Um, electronics is a very uh, big area. Hard home is getting some attention oh, and really? some traction, as well as things like electronics and games. So you're seeing those kind of things where people want to shop online and want to see what you have. So you want to get your inventory accuracy right. And that, that's what's driving the adoption in those other categories as well. Interesting. Exactly. You know, so, you know, where there's, you know, skew complexity, right, is very high, then, our, you know, that RFID technology really lends itself to um, help uh, in, in terms of inventory management and visibility, right? Like, you, if you think of shoes, you know, how many types of shoes are there, you know, color, right. style, size, everything is different. Then what happens is the inventory management becomes much harder, right? So you need to use technology uh, in those spaces. Yeah, that's a good point. Actually, I never thought about the, the mesh. Like, yeah, yeah the, the the complexity of like the fact that the small and the medium sized shirt look very close together for the average person that's doing the inventory count in the store. Um, you know, or the shoes in the same same vein. Yeah, that, that's a part of the RFID implementation. I never actually thought about. Um, one other question I want to ask you guys though before we move off, kind of the the broad landscape here is. Um, there's also a difference in terms of how retailers can think about RFID both in their stores and at the DC network. So Umesh, how do you how do you kind of set the stage for us comparatively across those two dynamics of operations? Yeah, you know, most of the retailers have started with store solutions first because mm -hmm. you know they want to automate all the store operations, you know, front store uh, to back store, the back store to front store moves, uh, receiving at the stores and finding articles, you know, with the Geiger function and uh, doing the cycle counts, of course, you know, it's a primary use case, all of that. They start with that, then they realize, well, we really need to, uh, you know, uh, uh, get everything right in the DCs and warehouses because a lot of the e-commerce business and the DTC, there are two consumer business has, you know, has explored it, right? Mm -hmm. Over 50% growth in most of the major retailers particularly with the pandemic. So we are starting to see a lot more requests on the DC use cases. Mm, interesting, interesting. Okay, because that's fascinating me too, because I mean, I've been on record many times as saying that the changes coming out of the pandemic are gonna to lead to explosion in RFID technologies for the purposes of the fa mere fact that we need a better tool to give us better inventory accuracy, uh, you know, at the store level and across the whole chain, really. Um, but Chris, why is, why is inventory accuracy such an important part of a good omnichannel foundation? Like what is it about store inventory that makes it very different from an accuracy perspective than say what we traditionally find in a warehouse? Yeah, so stores are different than warehouses in a lot of different ways. So in a warehouse, you may have a very structured system. You've got uh, pallet locations, bin locations, whatever it may be. You've got processes for cycle counts on a regular basis, systems that do checks on what's going where assigned locations are a big deal. In the store, none of those systems and SOPs exist, right? Mm -hmm. You have uh, these great people called consumers, right? They walk around, <laughs> they pick things up, they may put them on a different table in a different rack. Um, they may mix up the assortment that's on the table. Um, a lot of times, if you have something in stock and the consumer can't find it, it's within a couple of feet of where they're at because somebody else may have picked it up and put it down. There's other things like uh, shrink that happen, both internal and external, mm -hmm. that'll pull away from that. So you see, you know, uh, up to a couple percent of distortion in that inventory accuracy on a monthly basis. And typically, retailers will do inventory accuracy uh, checks, or um, you know, basically they analyze inventory once, maybe twice a year. A lot of times, those are done in the January, February timeframe because that's when they have the least amount of merchandise, right? It's the cheapest time to go through and count things because it's expensive. But as you have that degradation through the calendar year, when you get to peak season, which is where you want to have the highest level of confidence, that's probably where you have the least inventory accuracy. And generally, a store is in the neighborhood of plus or minus 70% accurate at the SKU level, not meaning that you're missing 70% of the items, but you have a distortion where a good example is you may think you have three mediums, but you actually have two mediums. And one of those mediums that you thought you had is actually a large. Mm -hmm. um, so you have distortion that happens there. So that's kind of the dichotomy between the stores and the and the DC side. 
I do think there's some distortion that happens on the DC side as well that Dimesh mentioned. So things like pick pack validation through tunnels and chambers and things like that going out. We've seen many retailers and brands get some benefits out of those uh, use cases as well. Yeah, and Chris, just to put it put a point of perspective in for the audience, you you mentioned that inventory actually at the store levels like you know generally in the sixty to seventy percent range. At the warehouse, where did where does that where does that figure typically run? You're typically running in the high nineties um, for the most part. Um, you know, it's those people on this call that are in logistics still know that if you're not ro- operating in the high nineties, you, you're going to be in a, a lot of trouble. So that's a big difference between A and B, right? Yeah. And that's a start point that I always try to bring up when I'm talking to people about the subject too, because usually their eyes glaze over like, what? That my, my accuracy is that different from a warehouse? And it's like, yes, it is. I mean, you think about it, like you said, people are grabbing stuff off the shelves, they're moving things around, you know, there's theft, loss, all that kind of stuff. So it makes a ton of sense. But the point I think that you bring up too, that's really interesting is the holiday season. Because yeah, the counts are maybe happening after the holiday season, but the, the holiday season is when you need the counts to be accurate and there's more of that activity happening in the store. And so, you know, by rationale, you'd actually say that you're, that's probably the time of year where you're going to have the biggest issues from an inventory accuracy perspective. So exactly. Imesh, like, yeah. what are you seeing at the store level as people are trying to go into these holidays and prepare for things like ship from store, bond line, pick up in store? How does this start to complicate everything? Well, you know, uh, I mean, inventory accuracy, you know, the stock accuracy in each store is a key foundational use case that we do, right? So every time we go live in a pilot store, um, I immediately, the very first day when we do the cycle count, we see, you know, the gap between what they expect to have and what they really have in right. that's reality. And, it, you know, like Chris mentioned, they may be counting once a year. Uh, we take them to daily counts almost, right? right? So it's about, you know, it some, of, some of the retailers do, you know, a couple of times a week. And uh, typically, you know, you're doing cycle counts about 50 times more than what you normally would. So your inventory accuracy really skyrockets. And we see when they go live in a pilot store within about a couple of weeks to 98% plus accuracy, mm-hmm. right? So that really lends uh, itself as uh, to all the other use cases we would do. Uh, you know, this is a foundational use case. Once you have that foundation, 98% plus accuracy in each store, you can do all the other use cases really well and effectively, right? So ship from store, Bopis, Boris, uh, all of these different use cases that we do, uh, you know, all the on each other, cancer rates will go down. And you're also in, from your e-commerce platform, you're directing uh, you know, uh, the order flow to where it's actually, the items are actually available. Got it, yeah. So those are the types of issues you start to see around, yep. around the edges here as people are gonna go into the holidays. Chris, any color you'd add to that, that topic of conversation? Yeah, I mean, we touched on it a little bit earlier with the pandemic being kind of a, a real, boost to the whole omni-channel piece in general. But, you know, inventory accuracy is at the heart of being able to make commitments to customers, right? Guaranteed to promise. So Umesh mentioned pick decline. So as you do things like uh, pick up in store, curbside pickup, ship from store, these are key omni-channel initiatives that many retailers have, right? So at the heart of it, if you don't know what you have, you can't make the commitment. You can't take that order. You'll see that order bounce around to stores. Um, potentially ending up in a split shipment, right? Split shipments are not good for Omnichannel, as everybody knows. So if you can combine items coming from a single store, then obviously you've got some cost advantages there. Omnichannel can be an expensive adventure depending upon which channel you're going through um, for the final delivery. So being able to consolidate that into a single shipment from a single store because you have high confidence level and you download that to your, to your digital order management system, that's, that's going to be the key to success is getting it right the first time, right? So that confidence, that um, you know, predictability, certainty that you have it in that store is going to be key to that success. And I remember something we were talking about when I first met you too, and I think we were talking about it even at Grocery Shop a couple of weeks ago, but um, you, you, you have a pretty funny analogy to describe what's actually fundamentally going on here. Like you call it the iceberg analogy, like the guy on the Titanic sitting on the deck being like, Oh my God, holiday's coming. Like, I feel like everything's okay. Everything looks okay. I feel like my inventory should be accurate here, but in reality, it's probably not. There's a lot lying underneath the surface. Can you tell us, tell the audience a little bit about that analogy and what you mean by that? I, I didn't do it justice. There's no way I did. <laughs> yeah, sure. No problem, Chris. So 
Um, when I think about what's happening in retail, a lot of times retailers will implement what's called a safety stock. So they'll okay. say, don't get, don't act like it's not there if I don't have at least three, let's say. Um, so in many cases, if you have a SKU depth of you know less than three, it'll it'll disguise it from any kind of digital order management system or any exposure to the consumer online. So what you have is you have a group of items that have a SKU depth of three or more that are kind of the top of the iceberg. That's the inventory that you can see. Then below the water level, if you will, you have a bunch of different SKU items that are maybe a uh, SKU depth of two or even one in many cases because uh, retailers want to carry low SKU depth, right? Because that's a, that's a carrying cost for them, especially in the the tail end uh, right. sizes, like your extra smalls and your your three XLs, those kind of things. So those are all below the water, and uh, just like an iceberg, that's the that's the part, the unknown, that becomes the real big risk for the retailer, right? So going into year end, you want to display as much inventory as you can. But if you have those onesie twosies that you're not exposing on the web or to your digital order management, those are just going to carry over into things like markdowns or maybe excess inventory as you're trying to close out your calendar year, right? So these, this is what I call the iceberg effect because all that below the waterline that you don't make visible is where the problems are going to happen. Yeah, no, I, lo I, I love that analogy. I think it's so great to describe just the lack of confidence you have and all those you know extra smalls and extra larges sitting on your sales floor. And the fact that people are going to try to order those online and, you know, try to pick them up in the store, buy online, pick up in store or curbside, and you're probably going to have a pretty low level of confidence that you're going to be able to deliver on that. Yeah, um, and if, if I could add yeah. one more point there, Chris, just real yeah, quick. Please. So if you think about those onesies and twosies across your entire retail chain, so if each of your stores has, you know, right. a couple of different categories or items that carry onesies, twosies, and now you're masking those and filling those from an e-com DC, that's just duplicated inventory that you could have just shipped to the consumer that's probably closer to them than the e-com DC, and you could have done it in a cheaper fashion from a delivery and probably a faster service time as well, so. Yeah, and that's if that's in the, that's if you have the confidence to deliver it at all, right? Like mm -hmm. at the end of the exactly. day too, you could think you have it, then the person shows up and turns out they don't, and then, they're, then they leave disappointed too, which is even worse. But Umesh, were you gonna say something? Were you gonna add something? Yeah, you know, we're, we're, you, you talked about, you know, busy seasons like holidays and where the stores are very busy and, we, you know, our technology helps in stores also. In, you know, we, use, we do a use case, a very popular one uh, called uh, intraday replenishment. Even within the day, you want to replenish through the sales floor because the store is so busy, they're selling out of items on the sales floor very fast from morning to afternoon to evening. So our, our replenishment engine kicks in. And as soon as an item is zero on the sales floor, SQ, it says, well, you have it in the back back room, bring it to the sales floor. Yeah, right. No, that makes, yeah, no, the, the real-time capabilities that RFID enables are are pretty sweet, for lack of a better way, way to put it, um, you know, when I think about it. But let's, let's okay, let's dig into that now, because, you know, Mesh, I think you brought it up a couple of times. Let's, let's dig into it. And Chris, let's start with you. So, like, you know, if, if a retailer is thinking about, I mean, I think conceptually what we've described, you know, it makes sense. And, you know, people probably have a, a working knowledge of what RFID is intended to do. But let's click into this now and talk about what do you guys help retailers to do? So how do you, what role do you play, Chris? Let's start with you in, in getting this RFID landscape set up for a retail operation. Sure. So we've been through this, you know, over well over a hundred times around the world with a variety of different retailers and brands. So as a premier player in the space, probably one of the largest RFID manufacturers and trim providers in, in globally, we work with the brands and retailers to understand what is the best form factor to go on to the garment or item that's there. So should it be a ticket? Should it be a label? Which mm. particular design? There are different shapes, sizes that have different performance needs. We'll work with them to maximize the readability of that particular item. We'll also work with them to identify what are the use cases specifically, how often maybe they want to scan, um, what, is the, what is the benchmark for where their problem lies if their inventory accuracy is at a certain level. We'll work with them on an ROI to see if we can improve that inventory accuracy. Um, what does that look like in terms of sales improvement? What does that maybe look like even in customer experience improvement? Those kind of things. Got it, got it. And then Umesh, how do, how do you fit in? Because like, you know, the, basically the world your company plays is somebody says, okay, I want to, I want to implement this. I want to work with a company like yours, a company like Avery Denison's to make this happen. So like, take us through, like, what is, what does this look like if somebody wants to pilot something like this with you? What's all involved there? 
Yeah, sure. You know, uh, Detego, we are a, a, a software provider, right? So we yeah. have the best SaaS platform out there. And what we do is, you know, typically retailers hold us responsible for the use cases and the KPIs. Okay. So, uh, so meaning, you know, we we end up being responsible for the end result. Uh, you know, so stock accuracy typically is the KPI for pilots uh, when they do store uh, pilots. So if they're at 70%, we want to get it to 98% plus, and that's what we are shooting for. So what we typically do is we work with the uh, with Avery Dennison and the hardware providers. We bring everybody together from day one. And we also create a cross-functional team with the retailer, that is such as IT team, store ops, planning, merchandising, all of them, you know, and finance teams together and start working on the project. We do the tag ups, you know, we typically go to the store, you know, uh, early yeah. in the morning at 4 a.m. at yeah. night, and then light up the store, you know, within a day or two and uh, teach them how to do the cycle count and everything after the tagging is done. And, uh, you know, we work with uh, our partner, Avery Dennison, to get the source tagging program started, conduct workshops together do the training, the deployment, everything. Yeah. Yeah. And so is that, I mean, is that simple? Is that, is it, is as simple as it sounds like it's just about getting everybody aligned on the fact that we're going to do this. And then, you know, from a piloting perspective, going in the store and just tagging the items and getting the processes in place, not worrying about, I mean, you can worry about upstream and we'll talk about DC pilots too. I want to talk about that. Cause I think that's an important topic of conversation that we teased before. But you know, is it is it that simple, like to just get it done, or am I am I missing something? It, it is fairly simple, you know. For store pilots, uh, it's uh, we can actually go live within about four to six weeks, wow. you know, from the from the get go, right, yep. from from the start. And then there's a lag time, you know, if they don't start the source tagging program right away, uh, we can also enable DC tagging uh, for, in the interim, right? So. Chris, you want to add to that? Yeah, so I think Umesh is, is right. You know, we've seen the, you know, the introduction of the SaaS model into the space has been a huge uh, shift, and that happened mm. several years ago. So being able to do that, uh, not requiring an in-store server and things like that, that were kind of some barriers to entry from an infrastructure uh, perspective previously, I think that's sped up the ability of people like Detego to be able to go to market quicker, get pilots stood up quicker. The source tagging is always an interesting thing because when you have the pilot and it, it is successful, mm -hmm. obviously it takes time from the, to get from the, the point of manufacture all the way into the store. Typically, it can be anywhere from three to six months. So we do see some folks be very optimistic and say, I'm going to do this pilot, but I kind of doing it as more of a proof, not maybe a, a pre-deployment, uh, a yeah. pre-rollout kind of model. And we're going to go ahead and start source tagging items so that we don't have a lag between proving out the management uh, needs and then actually getting the stuff in the store and taking advantage of the benefits. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, I never thought about the, the the SaaS aspect of that too. I'm glad you guys brought that up in terms of how that's changing the dynamics here. Um, well, Umesh, what's this? What's it on, now? Let's go to the DC side of the house. Like, what's a pilot Im implementation look like there? Like, how do you get that off the ground? Is it similar, different? Like, put that in perspective for us. Yeah. So in the DCs, it's a little different. You know, we use different hardware for different use cases. You know, okay. in the DCs, typically some of the use cases are receiving, right? Inbound receiving from the factory to the DC. Typically we see discrepancies if they're not doing RFID verification of ASNs, anywhere from five to 15% discrepancies. So then they have to reconcile with the factories and do chargebacks, et cetera. So we essentially eliminate that. You know, we use RFID tunnels for receiving and uh, and then there is uh, you know the, the outbound right so mm -hmm. shipping so we do shipping verification you know because every let's say you are, you're running a thousand stores every store is not ordering the same thing right mm -hmm. so the stores order what they need so they have to pack it properly in the DC for the orders that they get from the stores and then ship it so we do that verification. And during that process, we also create RFID enabled ASNs, meaning advanced shipping notices, mm -hmm. to the store. So when the when the cartons, the boxes get to the store, the receiving is automated and it's about six times more efficient. 
Cycle counting is about 20 times more efficient than barcodes. So, you know, receiving process is about six times faster. So every store gains a lot in the whole process. Mm -hmm. and, and how does the tagging process get, how do you, how do you determine, how do you, how do you get all that part set up too within, within that setup? Like, like we were talking yeah, about before. So, so, you know, every denizen helps us in, in source tagging, right? So okay. all the, all the products coming from the factory to the DC so they have to be doing that. already tagged. Okay. So when we do the receiving uh, check, you know, in the inbound against the advanced shipping notices, anything missing, we do exception tagging at the DC, you know, so uh, we use the Avery Denison printers for that. We can run remotely run the printers and, you know, okay. enable tagging there for exceptions. Yeah. Chris, anything you'd add there? Yeah, so no, I think I'm actually at the nail on the head. You know, from the source tagging perspective, you know, we try to drive it as close to the needle as possible for the tagging. Um, we will often just look at the existing trim and see if we can incorporate the RFID component into the hang tag or the or the sticker that's going on the poly bag or the item, whatever it may be. We also are doing a lot of things around sewn in related things. So mm -hmm. utilizing maybe like a care label as the carrier for that uh, particular RFID component. I would say that the use cases of the DC can be different a little bit than what's happening in the store. By that, I mean that the performance requirements might be different. So we often look at it holistically from mm -hmm. the point of manufacturer use all the way to the end store use and make sure that if we're going to have other use cases that may have some slightly more challenging uh, performance requirements that we're recommending the proper inlay for those particular use cases so that we kind of have the, the best performing inlay that fits all the use cases, not just the in store. Oh wow, that's an important point. I've never thought about that. Yeah, they, they, you could design, you could sit, you could in theory design the setup of the tags differently for DCs versus stores, but you've got to actually think about that holistically across this if you're going to do this right over the long term. That's that's a great point. Um, what uh, I'm curious to you, maybe maybe one or two more questions for you guys before we get you out of here. But I'm curious, any any case studies you can share based on your long history where you've seen people, you know, try to implement what we're discussing and just have some big epiphany that you know, or some big surprise that jumped out at you? Like what, what's your favorite like anecdotal story that you can share with us in that regard? Maybe Chris will go with you first. Yeah. So I, 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 I don't want to name the, the, the retailer, but there's always, no, uh, there's always things that pop up. And so I always like to say that RFID doesn't solve the problems. It sort of shines the light, the flashlight in the corner, right? So operationally, it's providing you the tools to fix what's wrong that you may or may not be aware of. So we did one pilot, uh, that eventually rolled out with a retailer and they had a rule that they would only do um, displays of product lines where they had a full size run. It was kind of unique and oh, that if, okay. they had, if they didn't have the full run all the way from, let's say, the extra small to the large, they wouldn't merchandise those products. And that was sort of a cons the way that their model was done. So when we went in and we did the pilot. It was saying that, you know, there was a lot of things in the back of house that were not presented for the customer. Um, so that was a challenge for them. And then, you know, the same retailer actually had a shoe display related piece where they had a very large assortment of shoes that were not actually available. Um, I won't mention the dollar amount, but it was a lot of money that uh, was sitting in the back of house. So right. we didn't really talk about it, but shoe, shoe display compliance, especially in women's shoes, if right. you're looking at making sure that you have every color that's available out on the floor, um, they're not typically going to go and say, hey, do you have this in a, in a pink or something? Right. So they had a very large assortment of items in the back of house that were not sitting on the floor. So that, that was a big eye opener for them. And they were able to, to quickly remedy that situation. That's cool. Yes, yeah, so you can actually understand what's presented on the floor, not only just where it is, but where it is in the store too, is a key yep. component of this, right? That's a great exactly. point to bring up here. Exactly. Um, Umesh, what's your favorite story that you can share with us in terms of what you, you know, some yeah. moment you remember? Sure. You know, I mean, I, 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 now I'm seeing retailers, you know, who are tagging items that cost only $3 selling price. Right. That, that, that is, uh, you know, incredible, you know, the journey that's taken place over the years. So essentially every retailer wants to tag everything, 100% of the items that they sell because inventory accuracy is extremely important to them, right? And also uh, what you don't show, you don't sell. So planogram compliance is key, right? So we are using, we are doing some of the artificial intelligence, machine learning use cases mm. that we have deployed where planogram compliance becomes key and each store planogram 
the bell curve starts to change over time, uh-huh. depending on where the store is, depending on the weather patterns and the people who live there, what they buy is different. So we actually customize each store to that and, uh, and be compliant on the plan of that. Okay, wow, I wasn't expecting it there, but yeah, that, that's kind of the, the next gen topic that I think is really fascinating, like the whole tie-ins with RFID, computer vision, the AI componentry here is of what's happening in your store at all times. Um, but yeah, that's, it's great because it close it brings us to a great closing point too, because every time I, I do these, I, I, if I can, if I have the time, I like to ask the question of, you know, having you guys, I actually like to have you guys prognosticate a little bit on the future. So, um, so I'd like to know that. I mean, I think if, if you guys, um, if you look at how this landscape's playing out, especially as we talked about from an omni-channel perspective, for those that get behind RFID, what in your minds are they going to be able to do faster and better than their competition in the long run? Chris, let's start with you. Yeah, so I, I think we're just going to see a you know expansion of the categories that people are tagging with RFID. Some of the use cases will will expand as they go into other categories such as uh, food, so expiration management, um, being able to identify those kind of things in that category will be um, good. Supply chain uh, visibility. Um, transparency to the consumers as well. So GS1 has done a lot of great work around digital IDs and being mm-hmm. able to trace that item through its entire life cycle. So the provenance or ownership of that, where it was produced, how it was produced, um, getting that digital ID matched up with the EPC, the electronic product code that RFID represents, will provide a lot of that. But I do think that we'll see massive category expansion over the next couple of years into, you know, it's traditionally been more apparel, but like I said, some more general merchandise categories, food categories, things like that as well. So Chris, I, I picked up a little bit on the first part you said too, like is there a little element of demand shaping that starts to 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 come into play here too over time with all the different yeah. omnichannel capabilities that people are now doing? Yeah, that's a good call out. So, uh, you know, I mentioned transparency and visibility to the supply chain side is as you start to look through your your supply chain and you can tag sooner and you can see these events that are happening. Now you can start to look and say, hey, what what can I guarantee or what can I promise to deliver when can I can I start promising things earlier in the supply chain because I have that certainty, right? The predictability of when things are gonna happen becomes much greater farther back in the supply chain if you can, if you can capture that data. So we're seeing people start to leverage that, that visibility in the supply chain um, earlier in the process to maybe do some changes on how they might allocate product when they might create visibility for you know, their systems and consumers earlier to make the commitment. Yeah, wow, that's fascinating. Okay, very cool. Um, Umesh, same question to you. What do you, what do you, what do you see? Do you agree with Chris? Anything you'd add? Like, sure. what points would you bring up to you on? Uh, would you bring up on how the future is going to play out for those that get behind this? Yeah, a couple of things. Right? You know, real time visibility. You know, every store you have, what you have in each sales floor. You know, what do you have in store number twenty two right now at this moment, and what do they have in the back room? What do they have in off sites and in the DCs, etc. So that type of real-time visibility drives compliance you know so if you're running a thousand stores you would be able to see what's the accuracy of each store and manage the store and their performance hmm. uh, you know what is there on floor availability 99.6 percent mm-hmm. plus mm-hmm. so you can see that type those types of metrics and manage the manage your entire enterprise and business so that's key and we are able to do that you know in real time and uh, the other thing is combining it with our data science and combining dwell times with lead times, right, is key because lead times have changed dramatically with COVID, right? Mm-hmm. And everybody is struggling. So how do we predict when you should order certain SKUs for the next season, right? And how long do you keep an item, similar item in the store and how long do they typically stay in each store? Mm-hmm. And based on that, we are able to predict when you should really do, you know, when, uh, do your reorder points. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Kind of similar to what Chris, what Chris was saying before too. The point that's interesting there too that I've never thought about with RFID is one of the one of the value propositions here too is the brand consistency, right? Like branding is very important to retailers and having a a, a, a greater level of surety that you have that level of consistency is probably pretty important. The part I thought you guys would say actually that I was surprised you didn't. So I'm curious, I want to get you to weigh in on this one too, before I let you out of here. But I, you know, with all this talk of like stores becoming 
micro warehouses and fulfillment centers, you know, automated to a large degree and, you know, picking and packing on site or very nearby to where their stores are located. You know, I thought, I thought that would be the thing that like, you know, jumped to the top of the list for you guys in terms of what RFID was going to enable uh, retailers to move faster on. What are, what are your thoughts on that whole topic? You know, stores as micro warehouses, Umesh, maybe why don't you go first? Sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, most recently they've been using every store as a micro DC, right? Yeah, Which, everybody is. Yeah. And the e-commerce platforms basically direct the orders they're getting based on which store has that item and what, which store is close to basically your house, the customer's house, right? Where they are, where they're at, they can match that. And uh, so that lends itself to, you know, better omnichannel fulfillment. Um, so anything else to add, Chris? Yeah. Yeah, no, I would agree. I, so that's kind of part of that visibility. I think if you look at the store itself, it is in essence for what I, I refer to as forward deployed inventory, right? Yeah, it's closer right. to the consumer. Um, in many ways, you can get it across town a lot faster than you can get it to the e-com DC. Um, so you can compete with other people in terms of speed and cost on those fronts. But I would also say that you know there's some other areas that are kind of interesting as well, specifically conversion, right? So inside the store, if you can understand what's going in the fitting room versus what's getting sold very early in the season, there's a lot of very mm. valuable conversion data that is there. Um, so I think as the technology you know continues to evolve, we'll see retailers start to merge some of those conversion options into the mix and what they're doing and saying, hey, I can see what people are clicking on and buying on the web. So how do I get the same type of data out of my physical infrastructure, just like I do my digital infrastructure? Yeah, yep. that's great. I love that. I love, that's why I love what I do, guys, because like I ask a question about micro fulfillment centers and I get to conversion in the fitting rooms and this all in the same conversation. <laughs> it's so great. Uh, that's awesome. But uh but yeah, hey, Chris, what, there's one more use case I want yeah. to talk about that's getting more popular in major cities like New York and other places. They have more than one store. A lot of the retailers, you know, they have, they have 10 stores. Yeah. So then, you know, store to store transfers is mm. also a good use case. You know, mm. one store in, in a certain suburb or region may run out of items uh, and the other stores may have it, right? So they do the yeah. store store transfers. Yeah. Yeah. And that's also, a yeah. And, yeah, then, good. and then change of seasons, you know, the store back to DC transfers also happens. Right. That's a good point too. Yeah. It gives you much more confidence in the math you can do around those types of things where it may be advantageous or not, but right now you're probably not taking advantage of it because you don't really know the answer to that question day in and day out. Um, wow. Okay, great. We covered a lot of ground there in the last few minutes. That was awesome. You guys totally unexpected. And uh, yeah, I mean, Hey, uh, let's, you know, let's, Put a cap on this. If people want to get to know you guys or found this content interesting, want to ask you more questions about, you know, how they can think about, you know, implementing RFID, you know, at their stores. Um, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Umesh, why don't you go first? Sure. Please go to detego.com. Uh, easy to go there. And uh, you can reach me there and also download uh, many case studies, use cases, and sign up for our blogs and newsletters. We create some great content uh, in this space. Yeah, you guys do put out some really good content. I always like, I always enjoy reading that for sure. Uh, Chris, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? Sure. So rfid.averydennison.com is the best place to go to start your RFID journey with Avery Dennison. There's a variety of different uh, resources there. There's a contact us tab that you can ask and we'll reach out and answer any questions. Also, I'm available on LinkedIn at krs.bart, or sorry, Chris. K-R-I-S, Barton, B-A-R-T-O-N. So if you want to reach out to me directly, I'm, I'm available there as well. Yes, indeed. Chris with a K, exactly. Chris right. with a K, yeah. Yep, not to be confused with Chris with a C. <laughs> All right, well, <laughs> well, thank you to both of you guys. I really enjoyed that, that conversation. I found it thoroughly engaging. And thanks to everyone who tuned in live to our discussion. Uh, you can find the recording of our discussion on OmniTalk here very soon uh and on youtube and wherever you and we will be releasing the podcast version of it as well and so you can listen to that wherever you happen to listen to your podcasts as well so with all that said thank you again so much to chris barton umesh kudavali uh to all those watching and listening be careful out there